start to Doug's here so we can do we can move along. You hear me okay, Sharon? Okay, thanks. So we're in our study of First Thessalonians, and we got into chapter two last week. This is probably going to be the second to the last session, um, and possibly, well, probably the second to the last session. And if it is the second to the last, next week will be a little bit truncated. I don't end well. I, 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 Anyway, uh, I think Doug's going to do a couple of uh, a couple of three uh, a, a study with us, and then we'll get into the uh, second book. I'm not sure who's teaching that. Uh, we discussed some additional verses in chapter one last week, specifically about the evangelism of this group at Thessalonica, and why they might have been so successful in their evangelism. Do you recall one of the things that we hypothesized might have been a reason for them being so successful in their evangelism? <coughs> Paul deals with this in both this book, but even more in the next letter. Soon. Pardon? The thought that Jesus would return soon. Yes, the house is on fire. Uh, you better get out while you can, kind of thing. And we aren't really told this specifically, but you consider their views of the immediacy of Christ's return. And Paul's dealing with this subject in both these letters. It's certainly something they're grappling with, certainly something that was right there in their minds at the forefront. And uh, may have given, well, one would think, would give additional urgency to their gospel message. Um, Paul mentions in this letter about God's wrath, and we talked some about that and how one-sided some views of the world are that God's waiting with the, like the Damocles sword or just waiting to drop the hammer, looking for a reason to send people to hell. Um, while a true view of God is what? Love. Love. He sent his son because he loved so much. And he wants a few people to be saved. All the world. All the world. And then, of course, the next verse, John 3, 17, he didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, speaking of Jesus Christ, of course. And then Peter talks about how Christ, the sermons last Sunday, God's patience with us is our salvation. Otherwise, he could have ended it long ago. God is a God of love, a God of patience, a God of mercy, a God of grace, not willing that any should perish. Then, then we moved into chapter 2, and as we did, we saw some characteristics of Paul's evangelism that were keys to the success of his preaching. Do you remember any of those? One of those specifically was that he shared himself. This is in chapter 2. He shared himself. He, he just laid it out all out there. He wasn't, he was very transparent. He did not try to hide anything. He did not try to delude them. He did not try to fool them. He did, this is me. This is who I am as a... Uh, Somebody over here, I don't know if it was Leonard or Doug, or somebody last week said, that he said, I am who I am by the grace of God. Maybe it was Donnie that said that. And he said, I just, I shared myself with you. I wasn't a burden to you. I supported myself. And we know he did that by tent making. He lived in an exemplary way. He said, I, I set the example for you. I didn't 
say, do as I do, but don't, uh, I mean, do as I say, but don't do as I do. He wasn't that kind of a teacher. He was leading a life that they could emulate and that would lead them to Jesus Christ. We talked about, in the sharing of himself, we talked about uh, a man that, that, that had demons, whom I have dubbed Crazy Harry because it's shorthand for that whole story, um, about how Jesus told this man, go tell others what I've done for you, what a difference Christ has made in your life. And basically Paul says, that's, that's what I do. I share what people, uh, share with people what Christ has done for me and that I am who I am because of Christ, a personal story of a spiritual journey. And we talked some about that last week. That's a lot easier said than done. A lot easier said than done. Because um, well, we open ourselves up for criticism, for mockery, for rejection if we say, you know, well, this is where I came from. This is what I was. This is what I have done and have been forgiven. As we, round, have that? Okay. As we round things up last week, we were in 1 Thessalonians 2.12, discussing the three words in that verse as kind of a continuum of encouraging good works, different degrees of intensity of helping others along, encouraging, you know, um, when Scripture talks about provoking to good works, well, that word doesn't mean you are provoking me, as my mother used to say. Um, it was a different provoking. It's an encouraging kind of provoking that encouraged, urged, and just did three degrees of urgency of moving people along in that uh, journey toward God. Joe, do you want to turn to Matthew 13? Do you recall when we talked about being chosen or called in chapter 1, we talked about one's heart. When one hears the gospel, what's the condition of the heart? And it's interesting that Jesus, this, this discussion about the heart is in this book for, in the beginning and in the end. And it's in... A number of other places. Um, it's in other letters that Paul writes. When Jesus' apostles asked him about his stories, why, why is it that you preach in parables? This was his answer in Matthew 13, 10 through 7. Disciples came up and said to him, Why do you speak to them in such many parables? And Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he who and he will have an abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Okay, let's pause right there. Is this saying then that some people just God set it up so they wouldn't? be able to accept the teaching of the kingdom? No. It's talking about the condition of their hearts, right? So their Go ahead. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You shall keep on listening, but shall not understand. You shall keep on looking, but shall not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous people belong
long, people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Okay, so again, what's he talking about? The condition of their hearts. That's right. When he says, you were able to hear, he's saying, your heart was open to teaching. Your heart was ready to receive the things that I had for you. And so, these things were for you. This goes back to this idea of calling and, and of um, those who were chosen. This is the idea. It starts here. Uh, the whole idea of those, Jesus said, those will come to me whom God has called. Well, again, where's your heart? Are you looking? Are you searching? Are you, are you trying to please God? So Paul explains in verse 13 that it was the way this group um, received God's message, it's not there yet, that made a huge difference in their ability to survive. And number one, that they received it, that was their open heart. But it was the way they received it that made a difference in their ability to survive and, and thrive in spite of persecution. We're in uh, 2.13. They heard Paul and Silas preaching words as if directly from God. And this allows the gospel to work the way God designed it, doesn't it? If our hearts are open, the gospel, the power that's in the gospel, Paul, what did Paul say about the power of the gospel? Yes, it's the power that brings you to salvation. Uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17. All right. Mark, do you want to read uh, 13 through 16, please, verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of man, but as uh, what it really is, uh, the word of God, which is So it seems to me if we kind of read between the lines here that Paul is reassuring this group of mostly Gentile believers. Now there are some Jews, but mostly Gentile believers who were former idol worshipers, because he mentions that, that they are not being persecuted because of their lack of Judaism, because they haven't incorporated these Jewish beliefs <coughs> the old law into their new system. Um, and he gives that, he gives as proof, he says, look, the Jews in Jerusalem, they got persecuted by their own brethren. It's not because you're not incorporating Judaism into your belief. I mean, he's not saying this, but if you kind of read between the lines, this message is there. It's because of Jesus Christ that you're being persecuted. Um, these, these Jewish believers in Judea, the Judean believers, they suffered at the hands of their countrymen. And of course, Paul and Silas are also Jews. But as he reminded them in the first part of this chapter, they had been persecuted in Philippi even before they got to Thessalonica. 
So it's not because you're not Jewish enough. It's not because you don't keep the old law. It's not because you don't revere Moses. if these were idol worshippers, which all they were, and now all of a sudden they're not going to those idol temples, just that is going to be noticed. Just that is going to cause them to stand out as opposed to how they were before. Peter talked about setting the prophets, right? Follow it as you would a light in a cave until the light comes on for you. The day dawns. Does this language that he uses here in 16, it stops from teaching those who are not Jews. Uh, these Jewish persecutors who opposed Paul and killed Christ, he says, in this translation, I mean, Mark's was a little different, but it was, I mean, it was the same language in different words. Um, that they are against all people. Does that remind you of any of Jesus' declarations about the Jewish leaders and teachers as he was trying to tell followers about God's plan? Doug, you want to go to Matthew 23, please? We'll be reading 13. So he's talking about persecution. He's talking about the Jews who persecuted, who killed Lord Jesus and the prophets, forced, this, forced Paul out of Judea. <coughs> and now they're trying to stop us from teaching you what does Jesus say about the Jewish leaders and teachers that were trying to stop him? Uh, just their kids. Okay, their the minds are unfortunate. Okay, that'll work. Oh, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Yeah. Hold the door. Don't let them through. Does Jesus sound as if he is condemning accidental actions or intentional actions? Intentional. Definitely intentional, right? You don't hold the door without intent when someone is trying to get out of the building. And isn't that what Paul means when he says... They're against all people. Who, who wants all to be saved? God, Christ. John 3, 16, 17, and other verses. Who wants all to be lost? 
Who is against all people? Satan and his followers. So Paul says about these Jews, they try to stop us from teaching those who are not Jews so they may be saved. And by doing this, they're increasing their sins to the limit. How would you exp explain that phrase? They are increasing their sins to the limit. How would you explain that? What's the limit of sinfulness? Whoever they use in their experiences to help people gain God, uh, they're hypocritical in that they're, they're trying uh, to be a gotcha to everybody that they're trying to hang on. Yeah. Well, they hold themselves up as spiritual leaders. coffee drinkers here? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, your coffee cup is starting to get low. What do you go do? You go fill it up. And to me, that's, that's the picture he's making here. They're aware of what they're doing. They see, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm starting to run low. I better go pour some more in. And that's the picture that Paul's painting here. That's how intentional these actions are. I got to keep this filled up. And it's no wonder that anger of God is going to come on them at last. You know, a thousand years, <coughs> the Lord has one day. It'll come. It'll come. Well, Donnie, since you mentioned it, Hebrews 10. Why don't you read 26 and 27? That's what the writer of Hebrews, Paul or Luke or whoever it was, is describing. Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. <coughs> intentionally are blocking the message of Christ. They tried to block it when he was preaching it. They tried to block it when the apostles were preaching it. And probably there are still some trying to block it now. And it's as if they've got this cup and I've got to make sure I keep this filled up. decided that they're going to block it because, well, you look at Saul. He thought he was doing God's work. But no. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? All right. These last few verses of chapter, any other comments before we move on? These last few verses of chapter 2 describe the great attachment that Paul and Silas and Timothy, this whole group here, have for this group of believers, which is in contrast to those who would desire to prevent them from being saved. Um, there's an expression of the great desire that Paul has to be with them. But in his spiritual insight, he understands that it was actually Satan himself who was blocking his way, uh, had intervened to prevent Paul's return uh, despite or maybe because of 
Paul's great love for and desire to be with them. And then Paul describes how he holds this group up before God as his greatest accomplishment in Christ. I find that very interesting. The Apostle Paul, three missionary journeys that we have recorded, maybe a couple of trips to Rome that uh, we only have partially recorded, preached all over the known world except for Africa. And all over the known European world, let's put it that way, and Asia. <coughs> and this is the group, he says, this is the group before the Lord that I take the greatest pride in. Ron, do you want to read 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 20, please? The brothers who we were torn away from So if you have a crown that you're going to wear, it's the best, right? It's the apex of accomplishment. You, the, the Grecian olive crown that they used to wear in the games, and now they have gold medals. But the crown, if someone was crowned, that was, that was the crowning event. Right? And that's what he says. I'm sorry? It was a symbol of glory. Right. And, and great accomplishment. Uh, truly, you are the crown that will take pride. You are our glory. You are our joy. It's you. Don't you think these verses show that Paul feels a greater attachment for this group? I mean, we don't see this language in any of his other letters. It seems to me that he is showing a greater attachment for this group than for any of the other congregations that he has started. And this is reinforced by what he writes in this next chapter, uh, chapter 3, the last chapter. He relates how he sent Timothy to them because he just became so anxious uh, or quite concerned and it grew ever and ever and ever more urgent and then he reveals the good news that Timothy gave him that just void his spirits all right Leonard you want to read uh, we're going to start chapter 3 and verse 7 because basically he's saying I, I wanted to do all this and now in chapter 3, uh, 7 through 9. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and afflictions, we were comforted about your, by you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. What thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God and in our account, on your account, right. as we as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your faith and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Okay. So our life is really full. Life is really, how did you say that in verse 8, the first part of verse 8? For we now really live. Okay, so this is living, Paul says. <clears throat> Having the news from you that you're doing well. That's living. That's joy. That's, this is great. This is how we would say that. And he says that I cannot thank God enough. For all this joy that I'm 
I'm feeling. I'm just bursting with joy. So we see then that Paul seems to grow ever more frustrated, ever more uh, anxious about how they're doing, how this treasured group of people, this congregation was doing, anxious about their state until he finally sends Timothy to them to check on them. And wow, this is living, this, this news. Gets his report from Timothy. All right, now, Leonard, let's go back and read 1 through 10. Yes, you're going to be rereading some of those verse, same verses that you read before, but um, we're going to read these. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we, those called it death, left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel to Christ, of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one will be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourself know that we have been tested for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. So it came to pass, as you know, for this reason, when I could endure no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us, just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all distress and affliction, we were comforted about your, you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For we thank, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God and our, on your account. As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we will see your faith. Okay, so notice that Paul reminds this group whom he loves so dearly that when he gets the news, it's like oh, jumping up and down. He never sugarcoated the gospel and its consequences on their lives. As, we, as uh, Jody talked about, if the gospel is not life-changing, then the person didn't receive it. Because the gospel has the power to change you if you have a heart to be changed. If you don't have a heart to be changed, the gospel will not change you. The way God wants you to be changed, that is. And he never sugarcoated that. He reminds them of their warnings. He says, you know, I was persecuted Remember, he talks about that he was in Philippi. He was back in Philippi. He and his followers were persecuted, coming there, and that they would also face opposition through persecution. His only concern for this group was that this persecution would become so weighty that it would finally cause them to give up. Uh, it would discourage them so much that they would abandon the faith. What would, what would be what would be the temptation that Satan would throw at them here? What would what would that be? See if you can find slide uh, 44 for me, please. Surely I saved it. Anyway, 
Maybe I did. Is there a slide 44? R54 version. Blank. Well, I guess I didn't save it then. It's saved to the wrong drive. It didn't save to the thumb drive. Well, I think that the answer is in verse 3. And I can get there by doing this. Okay. Yeah, it was supposed to be just verse 3 uh, with the next slide. So I think that it's the temptation here is a tool that Satan still uses. It's too hard to be a Christian. It requires too much sacrifice. Verse 7 talks about that distress and affliction, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, he, he gave to other people as well. Uh, Satan uses that against us sometimes as, as something to change our mind or to get us to change our way of things, like, like the God wants us to do. Right. Well, think about the apostles uh, after the crucifixion, before the resurrection. Yeah. I don't even feel like sleeping. I, I, I just, it's, it's all over. What, what, what are we going to do? This yeah. is our purpose. Yeah, we fought for God. Yeah, three years we've been fought with. So, I think that it's, that's why Paul is so encouraged by their faith. We're encouraged because of your faith. How, how might we encourage each other because of our faith? What, is it, what does that look like? How, do, how would we encourage each other, how would we encourage other Christians who are not part of this local body? How would we do that by our faith? This is life. Joy. Yeah. This is joy. Probably in that first century when you knew that there were was persecution going on here, there was persecution going on there, and you heard about a congregation that was just standing firm in spite of the persecution, word of mouth carried, and people would get scattered because of persecution, but you could see there would be testimonials as to what God had done among a certain group. Not as easy today, I think, to uh, be able to encourage other groups with our faith in this particular congregation. Although, when people come here, I think they're encouraged by one of the things that Paul talked about. He said, your love, your faith, your hope. Well... I think people see our love. Um, not that we're, but just, it's genuine. It really is. And people can sense genuine love and concern versus, oh, yeah, we really should. And 
And so Paul says in that verse, it was because of their faith and that their love that they had done this great work. That was in chapter 1, verse 3. And Paul has just said that he's much encouraged because of the faith. But, he says, I isolated these on these slides, but I'm, I'll use them. But he says, I want you to, to grow in faith even more. Be even stronger in faith. So he talks about in the first chapter, he talks about that they've got strong faith, they've got hope, they've got love. He talks about that in multiple places in this book, but here he says in verse 10, I really want it to be even stronger. And you notice about how Paul talks about the great joy he has because of this group, which just for me at least, further reinforces the thought that this group is so precious, so special to him above all others. It's just a very special group. Kind of like you all are to me. We'll quit there and pick up next. Any last thoughts? Okay. Thank you for your participation. Thanks, Leonard.